I prepared a CS story in the absence of the student preparing it. And I hope it's you all like it. So I found it very inspiring. Anyone heard about Margaret Hamilton? Don't look at this. Don't look at this. <laughs> Anyone heard about Margaret Hamilton? No? The quizzes need to really work on their quizzing schedule. I don't know. We announced that they were looking for people to do programming to send man to the moon. And I just thought, wow, <laughs> I've got to go there. <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Upper Peninsula. I just enjoyed school, but there was something about math that I just liked more than everything else. I liked deriving the answers because I didn't want to memorize. It was too much. <laughs> I was lazy. <laughs> husband was in law school they wanted the law wives my being one of them to pour tea and I said to my husband no way am I pouring tea as a Harvard law wife if I go to Harvard law school fine I'll do what the men do but I'm not going to be put in that position and he was very proud of me that I had taken that stand They announced that they were looking for people to do programming to send man to the moon. I was the first programmer they hired. I came up with the term software engineering and it was considered a joke. What? Software is engineering? <laughs> Mostly men were working there, and they had somebody at home to take care of their kids. I had no choice. I'd bring my daughter, Lauren, into work nights and weekends, and she'd see me playing astronaut to test the software and doing the kinds of things the astronaut would do. So she wanted to do it, too, so she played astronaut. And all of a sudden, everything came crashing on the simulator. And I realized that what she had done is that she selected the pre-launch program during flight. I said, oh my God, this is not good. We really need to put a protection in there because the astronaut really could do what she did by mistake. I tried to get it through MIT, NASA. No, they said, astronauts are trained never to make a mistake. was an emergency. Everything happened that we thought would happen if they made the mistake. So then there was a decision, go, no, go, land or don't land. Fortunately, the people at Mission Control trusted our software and they said, go, go, go. The software and the hardware worked perfectly. The software was on the ground <laughs> and on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Her example speaks of the American spirit of discovery that exists in every little girl and little boy who know that somehow to look beyond the heavens is to look deep within ourselves.
being fearless, even when the experts say, no, this doesn't make sense. They didn't believe it. Nobody did. It was something that we were dreaming of happening. But it became real. <laughs> Like the story, so, so really inspirational. And so this is the kind of tales you want to tell to your grandchildren. You know that. So instead of serving tea, I started hacking. I started learning how to code. Uh, she coined the term software engineer, which is so much in use these days. The, probably the first uh, lady to be hired by NASA. I think I don't know. Maybe one of the earlier ones. Uh, then this beautiful story of you know she she used to get a daughter along. And her daughter acted as the astronaut who would make a mistake, and that's how the failsafe was put in. And three minutes before the actual landing, the failsafe was required because the astronaut, by mistake, did uh, you know put the switch in the wrong position. Otherwise, the it would not have landed. So, just goes to show you know there is so much hard work, but there is also some element of luck being being there. And if you're really curious, you can now get the entire code for the Apollo 11 mission on GitHub. So this consists of a lot of assembly code. And it's AGC Apollo 11 uh, guidance computer. And just to again bring the timeline into picture, it started in 1965. And this was, so it landed in 1969. So four years worth of work. So this is something interesting that I found about uh, Apollo Styrus computer, it was 1.024 megahertz. That's the clock frequency. So anyone would have an idea of what's the clock frequency on Apple watches? Apple Series 1 watch. Any guesses? 512 megahertz. And that's just a watch. This is this has so many sensors, it has to actually land a bit. And it had A 16 bit registers, but the AGC you could get access to only for these registers. And this is where you know, some of the OS that we've studied comes into play. So they did have a multitasking OS at that point of time, which is huge. So 1916, and almost 50 years prior to today. And if you remember, we discussed how to, you know, how do different programs cooperatively work? Like, do each does each program give back the control to the OS, or does the OS preempt? So they didn't have preemption during that time. They wrote the programs in such a way that uh, they would periodically give the control back to the OS. So beautiful story to you know learn that you know the stuff that's around us. We could learn a lot from it. And if you're curious, so like for example, if we look around, so we have the projector. So anyone knows what OS this is running? Will this run an OS? Does this need to run an OS? What are the input output? What will be like what kind of memory requirements it will have? So these are the kind of questions if we really think about them. I think that's that's how we'll you know really start appreciating CS even more. Okay, some quick revision from last time. We discussed, we finished the discussion on segmentation. We said that the segmentation we have Registers containing the start virtual address, bounce, and what else? If we think about stack, how is stack different from the other heap and code? So we have we get the direction. And how can we say memory using identical code segment cross processes? How is that enabled? Yeah. How how do you what what attribute of register will allow that? Protection bits, so permissions protection. We get the segment at, as follows: virtual address times like and binary and segment mass shifted uh, by a certain number of digits, which is the segment shift. We can get the offset by this formula: of virtual address and and it with offset mass. The cons of segmentation are: firstly, it requires dash block of memory for each segment. Contiguous, which can lead to internal and external fragmentation. We then 
looked at this thought experiment that large contiguous memory causes problems. What happens if we can map each byte of the virtual address to each byte of the physical address? Does this reduce fragmentation? Yes. yes. But how much space do we need per process? A lot of space. What's the middle ground? So instead of mapping the entire segment or mapping a entire byte, we look at fixed size segments or fixed size uh, entities which we call as pages. So we discuss the idea of paging that we have virtual addresses which are divided into equally spaced pages and similarly is the case for the physical addresses. And each page on the virtual address corresponds to a page in the physical address space. We looked at the simple example that if we are moving say 21 to one of the registers. So 21 in binary is 01010. This 21 is what kind of address? Virtual address. So uh, we, we looked at one specific example where the, the first two bits told us the page number and the last two bits told us the offset. And we then translated this virtual, we said that the offset doesn't need to be translated. You only need to translate the page number, virtual page number, to the physical uh, to the physical frame number. And we saw that zero one in the virtual page number, page one corresponds to seven in the physical page. So this zero one gets translated to one one one, and the remaining part offset remains the same. So this is a physical frame number, and this is the offset. And this is a summarization of the translation. The offset remains as it is. The DPN virtual page number coming from the virtual address is translated to a physical frame number. And if we combine the PFN and the offset, we get the physical address. So we looked at another specific example when we were discussing about the trade-offs of paging and the page size. So we thought about if we start with 32-bit address space with 4K pages. So 4K pages correspond to how many bits? 12 bits, these 12 bits form the offset. The remaining, how many bits form the page numbers? 20. So the number of pages is 2 raised to power 20. Number of translations required, maximum number of unique translations here is 2 raised to power 20. And we have 4 bytes per translation that correspond to roughly 4 MB per process, which is a huge overhead. Page size trade offs, small size, if the page size is small, the number of pages is large, which means that more number of translations are required. But the, uh, yeah, and there is also more overhead per process in terms of the translation uh, memory required. But the benefit is that since the page is small, the chances of fragmentation are reduced. So if it's large size, there are lesser number of translations, lesser number of thus, lesser number of, uh, lesser memory overhead per process. But the downside is that the fragmentation is, is now more probable, given that the page sizes are bigger. You can always have some address space which requires only a small subset of the page size. We discussed that the page table is not really stored on the memory management unit. So where is it stored? Memory, which memory? If it's not stored on the memory unit, it has to be stored on on the RAM, so on the physical memory. So it's stored in the memory. And we took a simple example of a linear page table where each of these entries tell us the location of that particular uh, virtual page. So three, uh, three points, three uh, signifies here that the zeroth virtual page corresponds to page frame 3 in the physical space. The first page frame corresponds to 7th page in the physical uh, physical page 7, physical frame 7. 5 to uh, second page 2 of the virtual address space to page frame 5 and so on. And this data structure is called a linear page table. We discuss what other things are in the page table. So there is a prediction bit, which is for read, write, execute. Why would we use this? <coughs> so one is to reuse the code, the other is to ensure that the proper permissions are set. So we don't end up executing a 
you know, con contents of a page which should not be executed. Present bit, if it's in memory or it's in HDD or FSD. A reference bit is the page which is being referenced, is it popular or not? And we'll hopefully towards the end of the lecture discuss why referencing is important, why reference bit is important. Valid bit if the translation is valid or not. And dirty bit if the page has been modified since it's been processed. Okay, so let's look at a worked out example. I'll try and go slow. If you have any issues, if you don't understand, please let me know. Because if you miss even one slide in this set of example, you won't be able to follow the others. So let's, it's a simple example. We define an array of size 1000. And for each of these 1000 entries, you're putting array of i equal to zero. So basically you're creating an array of 1000. Each of these uh, you put to zero. So let's say this corresponds to the following um, assembly instructions. This may or may not be 100% correct, but this is just an approximation, just to get the idea. Uh, anyone knows what the first line is doing? Move long 0x02. Zero zero okay, so let's let's think out aloud. What variable are we incrementing here? So just, just find out in this, this piece of code where are we incrementing i. Yes. So the increment happens at this point of line, uh, this line. So increment eax. So from this we can get an idea that eax corresponds to i. Now there is something. So whenever we have these kind of instructions, this means that edi plus o into eax. So what would edi correspond to? So EDA would correspond to base address of the array. Why is this 4 into EAX? Because that particular long integer would take 4 points. So this is this means that this whole instruction means that the address pointed out by EDA plus EDI plus 4 into EAX, you move 0 to that particular address. EDI is address of array of 0 or the base address. EAX is the index into the array i. Increment long EAX means i equal to i plus 1. So 0 x 0 3 a is a decimal 1000. So you have to compare it somewhere that if i is less than 1000 or not. So this is compare EAX or i to 1000. Anyone knows what J and E could stand for? Jump, 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 jump if not equal to. It goes to 102. So if the above is false, then you move to 1024. Jump if not equal to 1024. But you already implemented in EAX. So next time it will be EAX equal to 1, EAX equal to 2, and so on and so forth. Till the time EAX is out. Everyone understands this uh, assembly instruction. So let's now now see how the memory <coughs> now how the memory accesses um, memory will be accessed. So we have the virtual address space. Let's say that this is 64k virtual address space, where we have pages of size 1k. How many pages do we have? 64 pages, each of size 1k. The total VA size is 64k. Let's assume that the code starts at the address 1k, virtual address 1k. So 1024, partly, because it is 1024, so it has to start from virtual address 1k. And it is in this particular virtual address page. The array, which was pointed out by the previous ED, EDI. EDI. So EDI corresponds to the address 40,000. And this, so since we have 1,000 uh, integers, each of four bytes, so the end address is 44,000, and the total memory is 64k. So, from 0 to 1k minus 1 is virtual page 0, from 1k to 2k minus 1 is virtual page 2, sorry, 1, and so on and so forth. So, this is virtual page 1, virtual page number 1. What virtual page would this correspond to? 40. 40 or something less? 1024. Less than 40. It starts with 39. 
If so you into 1024 would, uh, would be somewhere around this address. And it goes still. Could you do the calculation? Forty five, forty six. What should be the answer? Could you calculate this quickly and see? So, does everyone get the question? What page number would correspond to the address 44,000? 43? Are you sure? What did you want? Is this wrong? This should be 43. Should be 43? Okay, maybe Let's look at the physical address space. So we have to have the linear page table in the physical memory itself. Everyone remembers that? The page table is a data structure which lies in the physical memory. And let's say that this lies at physical frame number equal to 1. And uh, let's say that there is a physical frame number 4 to which the virtual address, uh, virtual page number 1 points out to. Everyone with me till this point? And uh, let's say physical frame number 7 through 10 correspond to VPN from 39 to 42, or if it's 43 to 11. Just assume that this is the simple linear mapping. Everyone understands to this point of time? We have a virtual address space, physical address space. The linear page table does not have any mapping entry directly, because that's the role of the OS to figure out the mapping. One virtual page number one, the code segment actually lies here. So the physical, so whenever we want to access the code, it has to go to this point in the memory. So that's the objective. Whenever we have to access the array, it has to go to this point in the physical memory. So what is the first instruction? Let's say the program counter points to 1024. So what's the first instruction we will execute? We want to fetch the virtual address 1024. But what is 1024? So it's, it's a virtual address, it's not a physical address. So you cannot access the instruction because the instruction would be lying somewhere around here in the physical uh, frame. So we need to find the virtual page number for v equal to 1024. That virtual page number is virtual page number is one. Virtual page number corresponding to v a equal to 1024 is one. So the first thing is to figure out the virtual page number. We don't care about the offset at this point of time because the offset, the offset into the virtual address is the same as the offset into the physical address. That's an easy addition. You get the virtual page number, which is 1. You go to the page table. In the page table, you find out the entry corresponding to virtual page number equal to 1. The page table would say that 1 corresponds to physical frame 4. So think of the linear page table either as a simple array or as a key value store. Or even in simple implementation terms, think of it as a pipe dictionary. So you, the key is virtual page number 1 the corresponding value is physical page or physical frame number 4. If you go to the linear page table, it gives you that the frame number is 4. You reach to this point. Then you have to read the instruction which lies at virtual address 1024, which means that you are reading the instruction which lies at physical address of the virtual address corresponding to 1024, which is this instruction. Move. 0x, 0 to ADI plus 4 into VAX. Everyone with me at this point of time? Now, what do you think will happen next? This is a move instruction. This is also requiring some other access. ADI, EX, 4. So ADI, EX, 4, what does this correspond to? So these are registers, but what address what operation do they lead to? So are they linked to the array, the code? What are these linked to? <coughs> Sorry. Let's go back. 
3di plus 4 into ax, what is this called? Oh, Array, right? So you want to store, basically when you want to execute this instruction, you want to understand what this address is. So you want to execute this particular instruction which says that you want to address EDI plus 4 into VAX. VAX at this point of time is 0 because it's executing for the first time. So EDI plus 4 into VAX corresponds to 40,000 virtual address. But again, nothing lies in the virtual address. Everything belongs to the physical address. So we want to now access the physical address corresponding to the virtual address 40,000. So we first found out EDI plus 42 EDX, that was virtual address 40,000, which belongs to which page number? So it belongs to virtual page number 39. You now want to find out the virtual the physical address corresponding to virtual address 40,000. You first find out the page number, which virtual page number is 39. You go to the page table. In the page table, you find out the mapping. So the mapping it says that virtual page number 39 maps to physical page frame 7 and that's how you reach to this physical location and then in this particular location in the physical uh, memory you store the values here. Everyone with me till this point of time? Sure. So next the program counter would come down. Now it comes to the virtual address 1028. What happens next? Okay, I need a warranty. Like, first we check which what instruction it is from the RAM because we have already converted the virtual page number to the physical page number, then we don't need to convert it again. We don't need to convert what again? Is this a question or are you answering? Answering. So you're answering for so what happens next. So, so this 1024 has executed for you. So program counter moves to 1028. What happens next? So uh, we don't need to convert uh, virtual page number to a physical page number because we already have converted it in the last. So what you're saying is uh, what we look in the next few slides, but we're, we're not doing caching at this point. Okay, so uh, then we check what page number it is. Then we, we first check the page number. Okay, the page number is. Page number is one. We for page number one, we go to we go to the linear page table. You find out the mapping, which is so virtual page number one corresponds to physical frame number four. You go to that particular location. So you also have to create the physical address. So if I, I don't know if you have followed this or not. So once you found out the physical frame number four, you need to go to this particular address. So this is an offset of four in the space number. So you also require an offset of four to get, uh, to get the physical address. Everyone with me? This point of time? So once you, get, when, once you generate that physical address, you need to you know, just read the uh, instruction and then execute. So, okay. What happens next? Yeah, first and the last. Yeah. What happens next? Yeah. Which frame number? What is four? So this is the pre program counter execute was has reached this point, one zero three. It will find the physical frame number. How does it find the physical frame number? Is there any step before that? Before that? How does it go to the Page, linear page table. You go to physical frame number one. Like virtual page number one. Yeah, it first goes to virtual frame number one. Yeah. And then goes to physical frame number one to check in the frame table. Like yeah. Page table. Right. And then it will find its particular physical frame number. number. Okay. And then 
it finds the corresponding address like offset of h right and it goes to particular h right good so it goes to 103 to find out the virtual page number which is 1 go to the linear page table find out the mapping the mapping is from 1 to 4 you go to the physical frame number 4 but then you require a physical address and not just a frame number so the physical address is composed of the you can create a physical address by, by adding the offset you add the offset you get the physical address you can read execute the instruction so in summary these are the steps which we are doing we extract the virtual page number from the virtual address so this is a very simple translation. We looked at this in the previous few slides. That how can we extract the virtual page number from the virtual address? So for this calculation, we need to know the offset and we need to know the number of pages. The top, the most significant bits correspond to the number of pages and the corresponding virtual page number. The last, the least few significant bits correspond to the offset into that virtual page. We calculate the address of the page table entry which is the location where the page table is located in the physical memory. We read the uh, page table entry from the uh, main memory. We extract the page frame number corresponding to the virtual page number. This is simple lookup into the, uh, into the page table entry. We build the physical address. The physical address is created by looking the frame number and adding the offset. And then we read the contents of the physical address from memory into the particular physical. Everyone understands this? Any doubts to this point of time? Yeah. Sir, the uh, virtual page number and the uh, physical page number are equal in number. Uh, no. Why, why do you think they should be equal or they should not be equal? Because it is one to one mapping in the linear page. Oh, so, for, so corresponding to a process, you have the number of Virtual pages is equal to the number of uh, physical pages, but otherwise the physical memory has a lot more pages. Right? So I hope that's clear. So his question was, is the number of virtual pages equal to the number of physical pages? I thought he was asking in, in, in total. In total, it's not because the physical memory might have a lot more number of pages. But the vice versa also might happen. You might have a physical memory of two GB, but the virtual address space might be thirty GB of a process. But when it's an execution the number of pages would remain the same. So out of these six operations, there are a couple of these which are slow. So the first is to read the page table entry from the memory. The other is to read the content of the program, the physical address from memory into the register. These are slow because these require physical memory access. For each translation, we are effectively doing two lookups or we are accessing the main memory twice. So can we do something better? That's the whole idea which we'll be looking at. So the crux is to use caching at this point of time to reduce either one of these two. Which one do you think we'll be reducing if we use caching? Third one, okay, why? Yeah, so because we can store some of these entries into some memory management unit or some CPU cache. But if we were to store all of these entries, so that's effectively, you know, in some sense, a virtual address to physical address one to one byte map. That doesn't make sense. So, uh, how many of us have heard the term memoization? How many have not heard? Okay, so memoization is, uh, in some sense, you're caching the values. Let's say if you're running factorial function or Fibonacci. So if you're running, if you're calculating Fib of 7, so that will be Fib of 6 plus Fib of 5. Fib of 6 will be Fib of 5 plus Fib of 4. Now, you have multiple trees spanning. Do you want to calculate Fib of 5 multiple times? That's how it's generally being carried out without any optimization. But memoization is, can you save some of these values so that you don't have to recompute? So that's the idea of factorial within without factorial or Fibonacci or any recursive algorithm. You can easily add memoization, which is simply a key value store or a lookup a dictionary to improve the speed a lot. So when uh, so now we'll be looking at caching, which is called translation lookaside buffer in uh, 
in, in this particular implementation. The crux or the key idea is you get the virtual page number from the virtual address. You check if the translation uh, looks like buffer or the cache has the virtual address or not. Virtual address or virtual page, if it should be virtual page number. If, if it's found, it's a TLB hit. So basically you have found the content in the translation lookaside buffer or in the cache. So you, didn't, you don't need to you know, then make the second memory lookup. Then we can easily extract the page frame number from the TLB. Yeah, so this should be virtual page number and not virtual address. You find the page frame number from TLB, which will be given by TLB or VPN. So I'm using simple Python uh, type syntax here. Page frame number you can access as TLB. So assume TLB is a dictionary. And the keys are the virtual page numbers and the values are the physical frame numbers. You can generate the physical address from the page frame number by adding the offset. The offset would be the same as the offset you have in the virtual address. You then access the memory assuming that protection checks work. If the protection check doesn't work, then you terminate or raise a fault or something. But if the entry, if the virtual page number is not found in the uh, TLB, then it's called a miss. If it's a cache miss or a TLB miss, what what would you do then? So we access the page table. That's so that's this effectively doing the same techniques which we were doing if we were looking at the previous slide. You go through the entire uh, route. You access the page table. You find the page translation. You store the translation to TLB, and then you, then you go to check uh, step two. Now, if you're wondering that, you know, if you have found the translation, why don't you store that translation, or why don't you store that back into the uh, registers? Technically, you could do that, and I think it's again a matter of convention or a matter of uh, algorithm design. So let's look at the same example again, which we were looking at earlier. Anyone has any doubts till this point of time? Because we're repeating the same example. So if you didn't understand it earlier, you probably have a harder time now. The, the program counter points to 1K, which is uh, virtual address 1024. You get the VPN for virtual address 1024, which is VPN equal to 1. You look in the cache, so it contains VPN and correspondingly VFN. It also contains other bits, but for this example, let's not bother about that. Is VPN equal to one in this TLB? No. So is it cache miss or TLB miss or a TLB hit? It's a TLB miss. If it's a miss, what do we do? We go to the linear page table. We find the physical frame number corresponding to VPN equal to one. The physical frame number is four. We then create an entry with virtual page number one, physical frame number four. So effectively this is the same entry which can be found here, but this is hardware and that is main memory and that is accessed via the software. So that's why it's going to be so. We add the entry into the TLB, let's say executed that, uh, and we breached. So when we add the entry into the TLB, we then search for that particular translation of the TLB. We find the translation, the translation corresponds to physical frame number 4. We go to physical frame number 4, we create the physical address by adding the offset. You get that particular instruction. So you get this instruction, move L0x0 to VDI plus 4 into VX. That, that belongs to this particular location in the physical memory. You read that instruction, it corresponds to physical address uh, or the virtual address of 1024. You calculate EDI plus 4 into EX. That corresponds to virtual address of 40,000. From 40,000, what do you do next? So you find the virtual page number corresponding to 40,000. That is 39. Is the virtual page 39 in the TLB? No. So it's a, it's a TLB miss. 
when you have a TLB mess, you go to the page table, you find the corresponding address, the physical frame number, the physical frame number for VPN equal to 39S, the VFN equal to 7, you store that entry into the TLB, you search for you search for that particular translation in TLB then, you find the VFN of VFN uh, equal to 39 from the TLB, that is VFN equal to 7, you add the offset, to get the physical address, once you get the physical address, you can store 0 into EDI plus 4 into EDX. Okay, so we will tell you what happens next. So, which is virtual address. Okay, then. Okay, so first you find one zero two eight corresponding to that you find the virtual page number which is one. Okay, then it is present. It is present there. So it's a TLB. It's a TLB hit. Then we don't. Then what do we get from the TLB? We get the physical page number. Good. So we get the physical page number which is TLB or one which is four, and then. Okay. Right. Right. Excellent. So everyone gets this low. And so then we go to 1032, 1036. Then again, since it's a loop, we keep on repeating these accesses. And correspondingly, we keep on repeating these uh, accesses also. So when do you think the next cache miss will occur? It happens when V P equal to forty. Everyone with me? And so Why? Why? So, what we can do, what the OS will do is so for each process, it will say that it was the page table entry lies in this particular location. That's how you can do that. Does everyone get the question? So, the question was Does the linear page table exist per process or is it a single data structure? So, it exists per process. I, I guess there could be other implementations also, but in the implementation that I know of, it, is, it exists per process. And the OS knows the page table entry corresponding to each process. So it knows it knows that for process P1, the data page table is on PFN equal to one. Maybe for some other process, that some, some other uh, PFN. Page table page table yeah. When you implement the programming, how do you know it's implementation So. So that's that's largely an, uh, a function of the instruction size. So whether this is a four uh, byte instruction or whether it's a one byte instruction. And uh, okay, so we'll we'll look at this separately in some other. I'll right, take some addendum kind of a lecture. We will discuss some of the architecture assembly kind of uh, stuff. For now, just assume that these are all four byte instructions. But even if they're not, they're not. Just assume that there is some mechanism by which you figure out that uh, the size is known. Okay, the first, uh, the first uh, cache miss will occur when you move to VPN equal to 40. Next one. 41, next one. After that. Assume that you know this is a very long program and this might go to VPN equal to 2. <coughs> so then we can able to would correspond to the next uh, yeah, assume, so assuming there's no other uh, there is no other you know some function or some stack which we need to access <coughs> yeah so we have a TLB miss for we can able to quantity so why do you think caching works why do you think it's a good idea to add additional hardware why do you think it would work well in practice? So in this example, why do you think it worked well? 
because we kept accessing the same place. So one is we kept accessing the same location multiple times. So this is called temporal locality in the sense that uh, so the instructions you're trying to access are linked in time. So if you're accessing something at time t0, it's very likely that you'll be accessing the same translation at time t0 plus delta t and so on. So that is called temporal locality. Any other spatial, spatial locality would be there. the array. Does everyone know what spatial locality means? <laughs> So even before that, let's look at a simple formula for hit rate. Now you can have multiple metrics. Let's define one metric as hit rate as number of TLB hits divided by TLB hit plus TLB misses. So do we want hit rate to be high or low? High. 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 Because if it's high, it means that there are lesser misses. And it means that we are accessing our contents quicker. Owing to spatial locality, TLP has a good hit rate, and the spatial locality comes from the fact that the array limits are spatially close. EDX plus 4 into EAX, so EDX plus 4, EDX plus 8. So all of these would probably belong to, you know, let's say, very small number of failures. But what if we had, you know, EDX plus 4 into random number between 1 and 100? What would happen then? The random number between 1 and 20 thousand. So then you'll have some access here, some access here, some access here. You might lose on the spatial uh, locality then. So the instructions are spatially closed. The other thing is that the instructions are also spatially closed. It's not only the array which is spatially closed. Instructions were 102, 1028, 1032, and so on and so forth. The temporal locality also leads to the TLB having a good hit rate. The temporal locality comes from the loop. So since you're looping multiple times, you're basically re-accessing those set of instructions again and again. Due to which, uh, since you have the translation already, you don't require to do that translation again and again. That lies in the TLP. Okay, so let's do one small example of how can I calculate the overall, the average rate of memory access. So let's say it takes one clock cycle, one CPU clock cycle, one clock cycle, system clock cycle. And a miss takes 30 clock cycles. So miss is very, very heavy compared to it. And uh, let's say the miss rate is 1%. So can, can you calculate the average time required for a memory access? 4 point? 4 point? So, so the trick here is, this is 0.99, so 99% of the times you require one clock cycle. 0 0.99 into 1 plus 0 0.01 into 30 clock cycles for a miss. But then when there is a miss, you also require an additional rate. So you have 0 0.01 into 30 plus 1, 1.3 cycles. So this is something which you can get confused, so you can miss. You can miss the miss, this followed by a hit. Don't miss that miss followed by a hit. Okay, so what happens when we have a context switch? So let's say that this is a TLB and only process P1 was in action at this point of time. So P1 is running. You have two entries and these are the entries corresponding to what we have been looking in the program thus far. 1 to 4 to 9 to 7. Let's say that P2 starts running at this point of time. So if we recall what was happening in the CPU scheduling, if, if P1 is not yielding control, when will P2 start executing? <coughs> Assuming some <coughs> will FQ kind of a schedule. If P1 does not want to stop. Some round robin kind of scheduling will happen, right? After a certain timer interrupt, <coughs> control has to go back. And let's say both of them are of the same priority for, for, for simplification. And P2 will run after a certain interval. Which could be very small, could be 50 milliseconds. So we've been you know, we've been acting very smart, we've been thinking that we can make the TLB, we can populate it to save some time. But what happens is you know, we've given it only a very small amount of time, and then process P2 starts running. So P2 then comes up with its own map. <coughs> it says that for P2, virtual page number 1 corresponds to physical page 30. 
So what happens next? Now if, if P2 has to look up, then does one got one to four or does one got one to thirty? And in fact, physical frame number four might not even be allowed access for this particular program because it's not its own address. So how can we avoid this problem? So one is to flush out or separately create a base table for a TLB for each. But I have a I have a limited hardware, right? So I cannot put a TLB for each. So one is you do some uh, space multiplexing. Does everyone know what is space multiplexing? That you know you don't you let's say there are thousand entries allowed. You allow each process thousand by the number of processes that we have entries. <coughs> will it work? Good. It it will work. At least it will ensure safety. But then you're not using all of the other space. The other is time multiplexing. Could you do time multiplexing? It's what she was uh, suggesting that you flush out the entire contents. You put the other contents again. So for each time unit, tail you allocate the entire tail to a single process. Why is this inefficient? Losing your so we have, yeah, so every few milliseconds we will be losing out the TLB which we built up with a lot of work. And uh, like Roma <coughs> built in a day, TLB also took some time to build up, we're losing it out. Uh, so both of these ideas don't work. Another simple idea which could work is to add another column, this is process ID. We don't actually use process ID, there is something else, we use address space ID, but you get the cracks. So we can store another uh, particular bit here, or another column to have that. Yeah, so, we look, so it's, it's a similar to PID in Notion, and then, but there are some differences. What will be in one, be map two, we don't know at this point of time. 